Hello, and welcome to another session at the DTU Unite event. My name is Dan Zielinski. I'm a project scientist, and I manage the genome design subgroup of the Center for Biosustainability. So, what is the genome design group, and how does it relate to other activities at the Center for Biosustainability? The Genome Design Group is part of the Design, Build, Test, Learn units of the CFB, which are tasked with supporting the strain design teams in their applications for sustainable bioproduction. The Genome Design Group specifically is focused on making predictions of strain phenotypes in order to empower the workflows used by the strain design teams. Specifically, we build computational tools that help to guide experiments in order to improve strain performance. The experiments planned by the design groups are then implemented by the build and test groups, and the results are processed by the learn group in order to help improve the next round of designs. The challenge that the genome design group seeks to meet is to make strain designs easier by predicting strain behavior. Whenever we want to build a new production strain, we often will build an initial strain that shows some amount of production, and then we go through an optimization process to maximize the performance of this strain. The optimization process requires a large number of decisions on interventions to make the strain itself, as well as the bioprocess parameters. For example, we need to select the, an organism or strain to use as a host, we often remove transcriptional regulators and competing enzymes affecting our product pathway. We may perform expression or enzyme optimization, and then identify media and bioprocess parameters that give us the best performance. When we have to make these types of decisions in a strain design workflow, we often utilize screening to test various options, or we lean on historical knowledge and our own intuition, which we call rational design in order to determine how to proceed with each of these steps. These types of approaches are vulnerable to lengthy development cycles, expensive experiments, and limited understanding of the underlying behavior of the strain. The goal of the genome design group is to develop computational methods that represent the real behavior of the strain and use these tools to help guide our decisions during strain optimization so that we can build better strains faster and cheaper. So that's the goal of the genome design subgroup. Next, let's describe in more detail what these computational tools actually are and how they enable us to better understand and predict strain behavior. There are four main classes of tools that we are developing. Each one is maintained as a software toolbox that is available to CFB strain design teams, researchers, and collaborators. As you will tell, there is a large focus on cellular metabolism, as this network is central to growth and bioproduction applications. The first toolbox is reaction flux modeling, where we calculate the flow of material through the metabolic network. We can predict the cell's growth rate, maximum production rates, and other phenotypes like gene essentiality. The cell's metabolic flux state, in effect, defines the cell's function in terms of what the cell is producing and consuming. The second toolbox is kinetic modeling, where we model in greater detail the underlying dynamic processes in the metabolic network, including enzymes getting activated or inhibited, and metabolite levels building up and depleting, etc. The greater level of detail gives us insight into the execution of the cell's metabolic goals. In other words, how does the cell achieve its metabolic function by producing enzymes at particular levels? The third toolbox is thermodynamic modeling, where we define fundamental physical constraints on the cell, such as pH and temperature effects on metabolism, electrical interactions between the cell membrane and metabolites, and so on. These models describe constraints on metabolic function and help us understand how the cell is forced to respond to its environment which is often dynamic and even unfriendly in bioprocessing applications where the cell can experience a variety of stresses. The last toolbox that we're currently developing is sequence modeling, where we're building machine learning models that utilize the DNA sequence itself 
to determine how the cell encodes its various functions within its DNA. For example, we have developed models that can determine how a mutation to a gene's promoter will affect the expression of the gene. In addition to these four toolboxes, we also employ other analyses, such as protein structural analysis, in our work when it's necessary. Next, I'll go into a bit more detail on the capabilities of specific tools, beginning with flux modeling. These models utilize metabolic network reconstructions solved with constraint-based modeling methods shown in the upper right in order to predict optimal reaction fluxes through an entire metabolic network. There is a rich body of literature displaying various algorithms and applications of these methods, but I'd like to mention a few of the tools that we are currently utilizing. For example, we can calculate maximum growth rate and product yields under different nutrient conditions and genetic interventions. We can calculate whether any genes are essential for growth, a tool that we are utilizing to design reduced genomes of different microorganisms that have greater efficiency and stability than wild type strains. We can calculate sets of knockouts and heterologous gene additions that allow us to couple the production of a metabolite to growth, such that simply growing the cells more efficiently will result in a viable, stable production stream. We can utilize protein structural information to identify protein metal requirements and vulnerability to temperature and oxidative damage, and with these models, calculate the sensitivity of different metabolic pathways to particular stresses. And finally, on the data analysis side, we have developed software for building elegant metabolic pathway maps onto which metabolic fluxes and expression levels can be mapped to better understand the metabolic phenotype. The next set of tools I'll talk about is kinetic and thermodynamic modeling, which are grouped together because they share a number of features. These shared features include similar questions that can be addressed with these models as well as similar challenges, including a large number of required parameters, as well as computational difficulty in solving these models. To anyone coming from a chemical engineering background, kinetics and thermodynamics are probably quite familiar. With these models, we explicitly represent the underlying metabolic processes in a great amount of detail. This allows us to ask very specific questions about the underlying regulatory and response mechanisms relevant to different metabolic pathways. The questions we can ask with kinetic and thermodynamic tools include, what is the effect on my pathway of interest of increasing or decreasing different enzyme levels within the pathway or elsewhere in the network? What is the role of different allosteric and metabolite level regulation on pathway function? And what is the effect of removing any relevant allosteric sites by mutagenesis? Are there any kinetic or thermodynamic bottlenecks in the pathway? In which metabolites are most critical to pathway function? And finally, what is the effect of media concentration changes, for example, where low levels of oxygen or high levels of product accumulation impede the production of the target metabolite? In terms of data analysis, we can build sophisticated metabolic state dashboards by mapping metabolite concentration data onto the network to identify whether any reactions are near equilibrium or whether any enzymes are kinetically inhibited or so on. The last tool that I want to highlight is our machine learning models for sequence-based prediction. Here, we have built a comprehensive computational suite consisting of DNA sequence knowledge bases and predictive machine learning tools. We are utilizing these tools to explain DNA sequencing data sets, including observed mutations, as well as to predict DNA functions, such as regulation and gene expression. Some examples of specific predictions we are making include, what is the effect on gene expression of different promoter sequences? Which parts of the promoter are important for the regulatory activity of different transcription factors? What are RNA secondary structures of a transcript? And are any of these structures important for gene expression control? And finally, what is the translation efficiency of an mRNA transcript and can it be further optimized? For data analysis, we have a rich annotation knowledge base that allows us to map any sequence variant to the genome and identify any known function associated with that site on the DNA. So that is a quick overview 
of the computational tools that we have been developing and the types of predictions that these tools can make. Now, I want to highlight a few of the applications of these tools that we have utilized for strain design projects. The first application that I wanted to highlight was how we use thermodynamic modeling to help understand growth inhibition in high density culture. So we have been running E. coli fed batch cultures to high density in bioreactors for some time. And with certain strains, we noticed that the growth crashed or stopped prior to any kind of nutrient depletion that we could observe. So we wanted to understand why this was happening. However, we did have two observations to start from. The first was that CO2 was accumulating quite a lot in the culture due to metabolic activity. The second observation was that oxidative stress also seemed to be occurring throughout the culture, at least as evidenced by the increasing activation of an oxidative stress response transcription factor. When trying to figure this out, we noticed that many of the reactions in central carbon metabolism that actually produce CO2 also happen to produce NADPH, such as the pentose phosphate pathway, malic enzyme, and isocitrate dehydrogenase in the TCA cycle. We then had the hypothesis that CO2 accumulation could be interfering with NADPH production. We tested this hypothesis in silico with thermodynamic modeling by comparing the allowed concentrations at low and high CO2 levels. And we found that NADPH was particularly sensitive to changes in CO2 levels. In other words, NADPH producing reactions are normally near equilibrium and so if CO2 concentrations change, it's harder to run these reactions and production may shut down. We validated this, that this was occurring by measuring the NADPH charge experimentally and found that it was indeed quite depressed in later culture time points. As a result, we have a potential growth inhibition mechanism that is likely relevant to many strains growing at high density, and we're exploring the implications further now. The second application that I want to highlight is our use of protein sequence analysis to understand how cells achieve adaptation to higher growth rates. Adaptive evolution is an experimental technique to grow cells under a growth pressure in often different stressors and then studying the mutations that the cells acquire in order to achieve better fitness. One of the key tools to understanding how mutations improve fitness is to map these mutations to the protein structural annotation and determine whether any important protein sites or properties are affected repeatedly in different replicates of the evolution experiment. For example, we identified that mutations frequently occurred at the dimer interface of GLPK. These types of observations have allowed us to design alternate mutations that have the same effect as the experimentally observed mutation. As we continue to build up this understanding of the structural basis for adaptation, we may one day be able to design fitness improving mutations without the need for the evolution experiment in the first place, greatly improving the efficiency and cost of a strain design project. Now to bring this section to a close, I'd just like to summarize briefly. The genome design subgroup is building a variety of computational tools to predict microbial behaviors at many different levels of cell function. Our primary purpose is to support the strain design teams at the CFB, helping to empower their strain design workflows in order to make them better and faster. We currently have four genome design toolboxes, which we maintain as software packages. These are for flux modeling, kinetic modeling, thermodynamic modeling, and DNA sequence modeling. We have already begun applying these tools to facilitate a number of different strain design projects, and I highlighted two examples here. The first was to better understand growth crashes that we had observed during high density culture, and the second was to understand the structural basis for adaptive evolution.